Okay. So, let us uh, continue. <coughs> so we're going to continue on the uh, first noble truth of Dukkha. <laughs> Buddhism is very kind of pessimistic, isn't it? It's always about dukkha and suffering and all those kind of things. And if we talk about these things too much, people sometimes get really depressed and really down. So I'm going to mention briefly, once we look at this, how to find the right balance, yeah, so we don't kind of overdo the dukkha side of things. And also Buddhism gets a really bad name if we overdo the dukkha all the time. We have to find the balance between sukkha and dukkha suffering and happiness, and then we get it just right. Uh, it is interesting, one of the things, when you talk to people, they get inspired by different things. Some people get inspired by hearing about dukkha and then finding a solution to the problems in the world. Uh, other people get inspired by happiness. If you ask someone like Ajahn Brahm, he always gets inspired by happiness, yeah, because uh, for him, Buddhism is all about jhanas and samadhi and, and these kind of things. Uh, but the majority of people, I think, get uh, inspired by a little bit of both. Uh, yeah, the fact, because we all recognize that there is suffering in the world, it's just so obvious yeah, in our own lives or whatever. Even when you've been a monk for 25 years, still plenty enough suffering to go around. So uh, I think it's that combination of kind of moving away from suffering on the one hand, uh, and on the other hand, seeing the potential for happiness. And to me, that is what is so powerful about these teachings. Uh, and we need to get that balance right. When you get that balance right, uh, this whole path becomes very powerful and very attractive, and it's something that people really want to do. You start to understand that there's nothing else really worth doing in your life. Uh, yeah, don't listen to other people. Uh, they don't think. <laughs> Most people haven't got a clue, really, what is worthwhile. You need to listen to someone like the Buddha, someone who has a, a kind of bird's eye view of existence. And when you start to get into these teachings, you start to see there's something very powerful and wonderful going on here. Uh, and then you're heading in the right direction. It's important to be a bit rebellious in life. Yeah. I guess, are you all a re bit rebellious? Is that why you're here? Because you're a bit rebellious. Uh, and uh, it's a bit, bit rebellious is good, uh, because if we just keep on doing what everyone else does, we're not really going to go any further than anyone else. And then life becomes just like an ordinary life, and it's not that interesting. Uh, if you want to do something special, you have to think a little bit differently. Uh, and this is what this is, uh, really comes down to. Uh, so let us uh, have a look at this next suit. That is also, also about suffering of samsara. Uh, uh, and... Uh, uh, I will comment on this as we go through it, and I will point out a little bit about getting the balance right between contemplating suffering on the one hand and understanding the happiness that should come with the path on the other hand. So this sutta is called Tears. It's a bad start, isn't it? <laughs> Starting off with tears, okay. Anyway, let's so see what happens. At Samadhi. Mendicants, transmigration has no known beginning here. No first point is found of sentient beings roaming and transmigrating, uh, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. Yeah. So we have seen this beginning already before, and this is quite a common beginning in the suttas. Many suttas have this beginning. It's an important point of departure for understanding what samsara is all about. There's a lot of information in those two lines, and I tried to bring out some of that information yesterday. The idea that there is no goal, we're not going anywhere, we're just kind of randomly moving around, uh, going up, going down, uh, going across, uh, without purpose, without really having any idea what's going on. Uh, and this is part of the problem. Hindered by ignorance, we don't know what we're doing. Bound to samsara by craving. Craving always propelling you into the future, into a new life. Uh, and you don't really understand what is happening while it is happening here. What do you think? Mendicants, which is more, the flow of tears that you have shed while roaming and transmigrating uh, for such a very long time, weeping and wailing from being united with what is unloved and separated from the loved, uh, or the water in the four oceans. 
as we understand the Buddha's teachings, uh, the flow of tears we have shed while roaming and transmigrating uh, is more than the water in the four oceans. The idea here is just to give you a sense of scale. Yeah, the time scale of samsara is so enormous uh, that if you look back upon all the lives you've had and all the tears that you have shed while wandering around, it's more than the water in all the oceans of the world. Uh, the four oceans here is the Indian equivalent of the modern idea of the oceans of the world. Those were the known oceans at the time. So that gives an idea of the time scale. Uh, if you start, next time you cry, kind of collect all the water in a bowl, <laughs> see how much it is, measure it, and then divide by the amount of water in the ocean, and see how long it takes before it's full up. Yeah? We can do an experiment like that. Would that be interesting? Yeah? And then that way we can get an idea of how bad samsara is. But it, it gives you a sense of scale. Yeah? And there are other suttas. This, this chapter here is called the Anamatanga chapter. The uh, n with no no beginnings chapter here, and um, this chapter has a number of suttas that are basically similar to this one. Uh, one of them is the amount of blood you have shed, uh, yeah, through the traveling around in samsara for all this time, and the amount of blood you have shed is again more than the water in the four oceans. Uh, or the amount of bones that are heaped up each time you die, or your skeleton is left behind. Yeah, when well that skeleton, if all those skeletons uh, were put together, that you have kind of through all those lives, uh, how many skeletons is that? Uh, it's greater than Mount Vipula, one of the great mountains in India at the time. Uh, yeah, that's the mountain of skeletons you have left behind, uh, traveling around in samsara. All of these are like pictures. Uh, uh, to show us, just you know, give us an idea of what it is uh, uh, all about. Uh, and when you think like this, you start to have more compassion for the world. Yeah, we're all in the same boat together. Everyone has days when you feel terrible and bad and things are going wrong. Uh, we are all there, and you start to have more compassion for people. Uh, when people act strangely, when they do bad things and they do silly things, uh, there's usually a reason for that. Uh, the reason is because everyone really is suffering in a certain way. Uh, so don't be so we stop judging people so fast. We try to avoid judging. Uh, instead, we start to have compassion. We understand uh, we are all in this troubled world together. Uh, yes, there is happiness in life, but there's also the downside. There's this kind of you know. Uh, roller coaster of emotions going through life, up and down like this. Uh. Good, good, uh, mendicants. Uh, it's good that you understand my teaching like this. Uh. The flow of tears you shed while roaming and transmigrating uh, is indeed more than the water in the four oceans. Uh. For a long time you have undergone the death of a mother. For a long time you have undergone the death of a father. Uh. For a long time you've undergone the death of a brother, undergone the death of a sister, of a son, of a daughter, the loss of relatives, the loss of wealth, and the loss through illness. From being united with the unloved and separated from the loved, the flow of tears you've shed while roaming and transmigrating is indeed more than the water in the four oceans. So all of these things are traumatic, yeah. and uh, I remember my my f my father when he my both my father and my sister had cancer. They both passed away now, but uh, uh, my father was kind of he wasn't too upset by his own cancer. That was kind of okay. Okay, I got cancer. I can deal with that. But then when my sister got cancer, that was much more difficult for him to deal with. Uh, yeah, this idea that a family member, especially the next generation, may die before you. Very difficult for a parent to deal with that. Uh, I could see that in my father, how traumatic it was. Uh, and he said he would, much, he, he would like to die <laughs> before my sister. That's what he, what he said, and eventually he did actually. He died a few months before her. But uh, that was very, very hard. Uh, it's interesting to see that, uh, how these things, our own death, sometimes we can deal with, uh, but the death of other people can actually sometimes be more difficult. Uh, so the trauma of existence, uh, and of course, you can't avoid it sometimes. Maybe you think that in your family it's going to be different. Uh, 
You don't know what it's going to be like. Uh, you don't know whether the cancers are just waiting to come out. Uh, it's very hard to tell what is going to happen next. Uh, and this is the problem of this samsaric existence. Uh, so how do we uh, deal with this? Yeah, the, uh, very, the very last part of here, the Buddha says, uh, why is that? Uh, and the answer is that transmigration has no known beginning. Yeah. Um, it is abbreviated. I don't have the full, the full Pali either. The transmigration has no known beginning. No first point is found of sentient beings roaming and transmigrating, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. Yeah. Actually, that's all, that's all there is, actually, that's true. This is enough for you to become disillusioned, uh, enough for you to become dispassionate, uh, and enough for you to be freed from all phenomena. Uh. So when you see this, you start to become disillusioned. The Pali word here is nibida. It means that you are repelled, quite literally. You are repelled by this, these things uh, because you understand this is just unbearable after a while. Uh, it's enough to have these kind of sorrows in one life. Uh, but if you've done this enough times to make a heap, a mountain of bones, you've died so many times, uh, yeah, how much are you going to go on with this? Yeah, this is life. It doesn't really have any purpose, life. But sure enough, it has a lot of dukkha. Dukkha without purpose. Isn't that kind of the worst of all worlds? Dukkha without purpose. We're roaming around, not going anywhere, not achieving anything really. Coming back to the same state again and again and again. The one universe comes, then the next universe comes. You start from scratch, society gets destroyed. You begin from beginning again. And every time it seems like we have a purpose in building up the world, in doing something positive. But ultimately, there's nothing left. Everything is destroyed. Past Buddhas are forgotten. Past civilizations are destroyed and crumbled to nothing. Everything we have built up uh, is then destroyed. And we become like Ajahn Brahm at the monastery with a fire. Everything burns down and you have to start from scratch. Uh, and you say, it's okay. Why is it okay? It's okay because you practice in the spiritual path. It is only in that context that this is okay. It is only okay when you practice a spiritual path because that gives everything else meaning. Uh, without that, there is no meaning to these things uh, because there is no goal, there is no purpose. Uh, everything just crumbles to dust uh, as soon or soon after it has been built up. Uh. So you get dispassionate, you get disillusioned, you get repelled by all of this because it is purposeless. Uh. And then uh, uh, Ultimately, if you practice the spiritual path in the right way, uh, you become dispassionate. Uh, you lose your interest in this entire world. And when you become dispassionate for long enough, craving gets extinguished. Uh, and when craving is extinguished, uh, that is when you are freed. So the final purpose here is really positive. Yeah, you are freed. You are the happiest person in the world. Even though it is all dukkha around you, you are happy. And. Uh, we need to be careful with this kind of contemplations. Yeah, if you take this in the wrong way, uh, you go back home and you go, oh no, uh, well, this is bad. Yeah, I don't want to be a Buddhist anymore. Too negative. Uh. So we have to be very careful with how we use these kind of contemplations. And you need to remember that to enable samadhi and meditation to happen, you need a positive mind state. Samadhi meditation is all about joy. How can you get joy out of this? Uh, Difficult. So instead of, instead of this, uh, this is only one side of the coin. Dukkha can support your practice, but happiness also support your practice. So you have to remember the happy side of the path, and the happy side of the path is uh, looking around uh, your fellow BGF member, seeing all these good people around you, understanding that the Dhamma is still available in the world. There's lots of good people in the world, a lot of things to be happy about. Uh, count the blessings in your life, uh, and when you count the blessings in your life, all the good things, uh, you feel a sense of gratitude uh, for all the things you have. Uh, yeah, you live in a fairly wealthy country like Malaysia. You all have quite good lives. You have the time and opportunity to come to uh, learn about the Buddhist teachings, to make a difference in your life, to become more happy people. Uh, and Buddhism, I don't know about you, but to me Buddhism is something extraordinarily powerful about these teachings. Uh, that if you have been able to find these teachings, uh, not easy to find. 
Yeah, it's quite hard. You grow up in this world with all the different kind of religions and teachings, and you have to navigate your way through this. If you find these teachings, well done. You're already shown acuteness and awareness to be able to find the right teachings. It is not easy. Yeah, you have come back to the Buddha. This is al already quite difficult. Most Buddhists never come back to the Buddha. They kind of listen to all kind of other teachers. Uh, maybe they are good teachers. Maybe not. Who knows? Uh, but the Buddha, right? He must be a good teacher. Otherwise, Buddhism wouldn't be here in the first place. Uh, so we have kind of navigated all this. Yeah. Wow. It's so great. I have all these teachings there. I have all these things, all these blessings in my life. Count your blessings. Count your kalyanamittas, your spiritual companionship. There's a lot of good things happening in our lives. And then you build up the positive side. So remember, find that balance there. Have metta in your life. Yeah? Not just compassion for the suffering. Metta is so important as well. One of the things that you see in the suttas is that when you see the sequence of the Brahma Viharas, uh, yeah, the divine abidings, uh, they always have the same sequence. Metta comes first, then you have Karuna. Metta is loving kindness, right? It, please raise your If I say all these Pali terms and you have no idea what I'm talking about, please raise your hand and say, please, speak English. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, you're allowed to do that. So, Metta, loving kindness, is always first. Then comes karuna, compassion. Then comes mudita, the sympathetic joy. Then comes impeka, the, the equanimity towards the end. And there is a reason why metta comes first. Metta is a focus on the good qualities in other people. It's about being friendly. That can never lead to sadness. It can never lead to depression. It always leads to an uplift in your mood. And this is why this is the most basic of the Brahma Viharas. And we should always put a lot of focus on metta for that particular reason. So focus on the metta Brahma Vihara. Make that the main of these four Brahma Viharas. And then comes karuna, compassion. It is a bit more difficult, a bit more tricky, because compassion means that you wish people freedom from suffering. And when you wish someone freedom from suffering, it's very easy to remember the suffering that goes with it. Uh, but, and so it's very close to remembering the suffering. And when you remember too much suffering, uh, it can lead to, it doesn't lead to uplift, it leads rather to a low mood instead. Uh, so be careful with compassion. Sometimes it's necessary to use compassion, uh, but make metta the main aspect of the how you practice the Brahma Viharas. Uh, in addition to mindfulness of breathing, metta, death contemplation, all of these things are very powerful. Uh, now you can see why. So these, this is an interesting teaching, and it's good as a backdrop to our practice to help you propel you forward uh, to understand the problems in the world, uh, but don't make too much out of it, uh, because then it may actually turn out to be a hindrance rather than a positive aspect. Uh. So having said that, I'm going to talk a little bit more about similar kind of suttas. <laughs> Don't make too much out of it, now I'm going to make more out of it, so just warning you. So uh, next one in the pamphlet here is called In a Sorry, Sorry State. This is Ajahn Sujato's translation, Dugata. Dugata means literally gone bad, badly gone. It's usually a word used if you talk about rebirth, you are dukati, you've gone to a bad destination. Huh? At one time the Buddha was staying near Savati. Huh? Mendicant's transmigration has no known beginning. <coughs> no first point is found of sentient beings roaming and transmigrating, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. Yeah? When you see someone in a sorry state, in distress, you should conclude, in all this long time, I too, or we too, have undergone the same thing. Why is that? Because transmigration has no known beginning. No first point is found of sentient beings roaming and transmigrating hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. This is quite enough for you to become repelled from losing your interest, to become dispassionate and freed from all phenomena. 
I don't like freed from, uh, free regarding all conditions, better to say freed from all phenomena. So uh, this is another interesting one. And uh, the idea when you see someone in the sorry state, yeah, whatever that is, uh, and if you look around the world and you read the newspapers or you look at the news on TV or whatever you do, there's so much, so many people who are far worse than we are right here, yeah, in Malaysia or even Australia, or whatever it is. Uh, there is a lot of problems around the world. Uh, and uh, when you see that, when you see people in war zones, uh, yeah, in Syria, in Afghanistan, or wherever it is, uh, in many number of countries in Africa, or whatever it is, uh, when you see that, uh, remember, you too have been in that state. And unless you make an end of samsara, you will go there again in the future. This is kind of the point. So when you see those people, imagine that that is you. Yeah, you too. This is already kind of inside of you, waiting to come out, being reborn in a war zone. All of these possibilities are there. They are like seeds in our minds, waiting to sprout, given the right conditions. And when you remember that, it, has a, it is very interesting. First of all, sometimes when we look at these things on TV, we think that this is other. This is different from us, just like I was saying the other day about when you see a dead person or you read about someone who has died in the newspaper, you other it, you make it different, you make it something that has got nothing to do with you. Huh? And so you don't really reflect on, oh yeah, that's death, that's kind of someone else. No, it's not someone else. This is about every one of us. The same thing with these war zones or famines sometimes you see around the world. Or the, in Cambodia, Cambodia is not that far away from here, just a couple of hours flight over to Phnom Penh. Yeah, it's not that far away. Go to Phnom Penh, they had the killing fields only a few decades ago. Millions of people. It's a small country. They had two million people or something who were killed in those killing fields uh, because of some misguided communist ideal uh, where everyone sh who had education or was anything should kind of be destroyed. Uh, this is samsara for you. This is what people do to each other. Uh, it's crazy. In the name of what? In the name of some ideology, name of some kind of utopia which can never be achieved anyway. The country kind of went down the drain, and of course nothing really came out of that, except for suffering and dukkha. This is what humanity is up to. This is how we live, how we do things. And one day, we too will be part of those killing fields. Yeah? Imagine being part of that. It must be terrifying. The government always coming after you. It was the government that was killing its own people. Government is supposed to be of service to your people, not supposed to kill your own people. And this is what happens. This is the world. So you too will be there, yeah, and it, 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 it expands your idea of what life is all about. It also makes you look at those people in a different way. Instead of those people being different from you, actually those people are exactly like you. Sometimes you see people in great distress and you kind of feel a bit repelled by it and you think it's different and you think that those people have got nothing to do with me. Maybe you might even look down upon them. Yeah, sometimes that happens. Oh, they are so poor and so stupid. Why do they do such stupid things? That could never happen to me. I'm too smart to get in that kind of situation. You're not too smart to get into that situation. Smart goes up and down. One life you're smart, another life you're really stupid. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, and then you stop having a sense of uh, kind of aversion to these people when you look down upon them. But you take them instead into your heart because you know they are people just like each one of us. Uh, we are all the same. That potential is there for everyone. Uh, and then it becomes a, a powerful way of uh, thinking about these things, uh, using these distressing situations uh, for something positive. Uh, yeah? This is what this is about. It's distressful, uh, but it also kind of brings out that uh, uh, seeing these things, understanding other people in the right way, understanding our own situation in the right way. It expands our horizons in this, this sense. And uh, one of the things that sometimes you see in Buddhism, which uh, is a bit concerning, and it's a misunderstanding of how Buddhism is to be thought about, uh, Sometimes when people see someone else in great distress or someone who is in a very difficult situation, uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, whether it's just someone in Malaysia, someone in a wheelchair or, or someone very poor or whatever, uh, 
Sometimes people think, yeah, it's their own fault. They did bad karma in the past. They deserve that, yeah. Is that a good way of thinking? It's not very good, isn't it? But this is such a common way, quite a common way of thinking in the Buddhist world. Because we take the idea of karma, we think in terms of karma, and we apply that idea in the wrong way. And there are so many things, we'll talk more about karma later on, because we come to this uh, in next. But one of the ideas, very common ideas in the Buddhist world, is that karma is like a linear thing. Yeah, you, I have this now, I, uh, whatever it is, I've got this illness. Yeah? And, because I, and the reason I have this illness is because I did what this bad thing in the past. That's why I have this illness, uh, yeah? or this problem, or this whatever it is. Uh. But it's not, it doesn't really work like that. It's not one specific thing in the past that leads to a specific result now. It's much, much more complicated. Uh. And the reason why we tend to think like that is because of all of those stories that are told in Buddhism. But these are late stories, they're not stories that actually came from the Buddha. When you go to things like the Peta Vatu or the Vimana Vatu, uh, these are the stories of the heavenly mansions and the Peta realms. Uh, if you read those stories, uh, very often they assign one cause to that result. Yeah? I gave this gift to an Arahant in the past life, now I have a big mansion. Uh, so if you don't have a big mansion, anyone here who hasn't got a big mansion? <laughs> if you haven't got a big mansion, it's because you forgot to give to that arahant in a past life. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. This is just a popular idea of kamma. Kamma doesn't work like that at all. Kamma is much more complicated. It is all of these things that we do together, and all of these things we do together give a very complex result in the future. The main result it gives is that you become reborn as a human being. And when you are reborn as a human being, there's a vast range of things that can happen to you. And every one of us has to go through a range of sufferings, not because of a specific cause, karmic cause in the past, but because we are born as human beings. If you're human beings, you can expect illness. Sometimes you can expect cancer. Sometimes you can expect to die young. Even if you have kind of lived an ordinary life, not made bad karma, still you can die young because karma is not everything. Yeah, if you can expect to get divorced sometimes, to lose your job, to whatever it is. All of these things are just part and parcel of what it means to be a human being. It is not dependent on specific causes in the past. So whether you are born in a poor country or a wealthy country, all of this is a bit of a lottery sometimes. We don't really know where we're going to get reborn. And also we have a store of karma from the past that may ripen at any time. You don't know where that's going to bring you in your next rebirth. So if you think about the other person as more stupid than you, as having worse karma than you, you just don't know whether that actually is true or not. Maybe you have in many ways worse karma, it's just that somehow certain karma ripened in this life that put you in a better position. We just don't know. And then in the future we become stupid again and do bad karma. Remember all of this is non-self. It is not us choosing one way or the other. We cannot take credit so much for whether we get reborn in one place or not. But we just happen to be conditioned in such a way that we do the right thing. And then you get conditioned in the wrong way. You start doing stupid things. It is all so uncertain, so unreliable. So never look down upon anyone else. Never think that they are kind of, it's their fault. Yeah, stupid person, I am better. <laughs> And I know that most of you never think like that because you are too wise to do that, but many Buddhists do think like that. And these are Buddhists who often are not really educated in Buddhism. They're kind of just grown up as Buddhism. They heard all the local stories, but they never really investigated properly. And then you believe these simple things about how Buddhism actually works. So when you see someone in a difficult situation, always have compassion. Always understand, it could be anyone who is in that situation. Uh, yeah, And then you have the right attitude. Then you're thinking in the Buddhist way, which is uh, very useful and is going to kind of lead to something positive. Uh. Kama and Vipaka is a very complicated 
thing. Yeah, and uh, the Buddha said, you cannot really think it out, all the causes and the results. It is too hard, it's achinteya, unthinkable, quite literally imponderable. Uh, that is what this is, this uh, kama vipaka, because there's so many causes and effects kind of working together. Uh, the main thing is that we are all conditioned, we're all in this together. Uh, whether you are a king or you are a poor person or a queen or whatever it is, uh, makes almost no difference. Uh, we are basically the same. Human state is largely the same for everyone. Uh, so uh, use instead this contemplation to remind yourself that you have been in all of these difficult situations. You can go there again in the future. And this is only a small sliver of that uh, samsara. Yeah, it's only the human realm. Then you can expand it out uh, to include all the other realms. Yeah? And then it, is, it gets much, much worse, of course. Uh, but uh, even within the human realm, you get some idea what is going on here. Huh? So I told you that tears were just the beginning, now it's getting w even worse. Uh. <laughs> tears, right. <laughs> so, uh, any, d do you have any comments on this? Do, would you like to leave this retreat now, once and for good? I said, I never want to talk to this monk again. Or, or, or <laughs> You know, if I say again, mm -hmm. relative, relative. Yeah, relative. Life. Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. It is. Yeah, you, we all kind of know it. Yeah, so it's kind of the way things are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So no comments. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Okay. Venerable. with the flow. Uh. No, it, yeah. Well, the flow yeah. is with the re reality. Mm. Right? Mm. So whatever happened in our life, the changes that happen, you know, we understand all the changes and yeah. accept them mm -hmm. as they are and then uh, we won't be suffering. So, we sh so that's good enough. We don't need to practice the path? Is that what you mean? Huh? Just, just accept? Well, in order to understand and, uh, to be on the path, right? To understand the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. changes mm -hmm. in reality. Mm -hmm. So what after we learning about what's happening, mm -hmm. you know, we understand what's happening mm -hmm. and we accept them. Mm -hmm. Then after we accept them then uh, things are not happening. But we don't seem to be yeah. no attack. If you are hunt, maybe, yeah, that's true, yeah. Okay, that's true, I think there's some, a lot of truth to that. When you understand the reality of things, you don't suffer so much when it happens because you expect it. And when you expect something, you don't, yeah, yes. And when you expect things to happen, then you also accept the same, these, are, these go together. Accepting and expectation go together. So when you accept it, you expect these things to happen in a sense. And then when it happens, you're not surprised. And when you're not surprised, you don't, su you, you don't suffer so much. Uh, yeah, so that is part of it. That's only part of it. Because the other part is that it also just reminds you, because it's, even though you accept it to some extent, to accept it fully is almost impossible. Uh, almost nobody can do that. Uh, yeah, it's very hard not to suffer at all. So you, you, you move a little bit towards that uh, and you suffer less than other people, but unless you're an arahant, uh, yeah, it's really only an arahant that can do this fully. Uh, even Venerable Ananda, when the Buddha was to pass away, he was crying and he was a stream enter. So even he wasn't able to accept uh, impermanence and dukkha fully. That shows you how difficult it is to do that. It's, it's, uh, I, I agree with you, you're right, it will help, but it will only help so much and you will still have a lot of suffering left. So one of the, I think, 
Acceptance is one outcome of this, uh, and, and I agree with that. And the other thing is that it also just reminds you how important the Buddhist practice actually is. Uh, it reminds you to be kind. Yeah? And this is one of the things that this does. It reminds you to get those basic things of the path into place. Uh, because without that, uh, there is no progress in these things. Uh, so you try to accept as far as you can, and then you also allow it to motivate you in your practice. Uh, those two together, I think, is, uh, uh, is very helpful here. Uh. Okay. Any comments on this? Yeah. To share two yeah. situations. Please. One, I think all of us experience here the loss of Dhamma Buddha. Oh, yeah. Uh, but of course, mm. seeing that he only suffered for only a few months, mm. it wasn't so bad. But for many who have been following Thich Nhat Han, yeah. after five years he's still suffering, sitting in a wheelchair. Yeah. So that is difficult to understand. The yeah. whole life dedicated to cultivating metta, mm. teaching millions of people metta, mm. and practicing metta, and yet mm. after five years he's still suffering, sitting yeah. in a wheelchair. Yeah, 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 yeah. Many people can say, oh, maybe you yeah. can accept it, but yeah. no matter how you accept it, sitting in a wheelchair is suffering. Mm. No matter how you accept it, yeah. so it's hard to understand, you know. It is very hard to understand, and, and it, because uh, the point is again that it is not about karma; it is about being a human being. This is what the human body is like. Human body is problematic, and it causes all these kind of things. Uh, an even more powerful example of what you are talking about is Ajahn Shah, Lumpur Shah. He was completely, he wasn't even in a wheelchair, he was completely flat out for almost for 10 years, yeah, for 10 years. And many people say he was an arahant, fully enlightened. And uh, still, you have these things. So he had made the highest kamma, the highest good kamma you can make as a human being, and still you have these kind of problems and suffering uh, as a consequence. So, uh, it, you know, again, it's hard to, hard to really understand. Uh, how much did Ajahn Shah suffer? Well, they say they say, I wasn't there, but those who were present and looking after him when he was on the sickness, they said that very often he would go into deep samadhi. Yeah? So, of course, that would be very helpful because then the, you lose the sense of the body and you can let go of all of that. Uh, but still, you know, even the Buddha in the suttas suffers sometimes. You know, sometimes he says, oh, I've got the back pain, I'm going to lie down and stretch. So obviously that is a kind of suffering, he has to lie down and stretch. Yeah? So even uh, the, the physical discomfort is always going to be there to some, to some extent at the very least. Uh. So yes. Yeah. No, when we talk about suffering, yeah. it's in the mind, it's in one's mind, not the condition that happened to the body or, <laughs> you know, external things. Right? <laughs> it's both. The, mind, the, the mind is the main thing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the thing is, you remember there are six kinds of consciousness in the Sutta, six classes of consciousness, and uh, when you experience the world, the the, the, the uh, attention moves between the different kinds of consciousness. So you have body consciousness and you have mind consciousness. Uh, so the mind consciousness of Ajahn Shah would not be affected by the body consciousness. So uh, once he, he will still feel the body consciousness as painful, that will still be felt, uh, but that pain will not affect the mind afterwards. So the mind consciousness will not suffer because of that. Uh, but he will still experience the suffering of the body. Uh, yeah, so, the, so this is the problem, that even though the mind will not be affected, uh, the mind consciousness will not be affected by the body consciousness, you still have to experience the body consciousness, uh, and that suffering will still be there. Uh, and this is, even with the Buddha, that is the case. Yeah? That's why he has to stretch his, his back, etc., when he uh, gets tired or whatever, he has to lie down and all these kind of things. Uh. So it's important to, when you say the mind isn't affected, well, what do we mean by mind? You have to be very careful here what we mean by that. Six classes of consciousness. Consciousness is always mind in one sense, but it's not mind in another sense, because you have 
mind consciousness being different from, from body consciousness. So you hear something, then your mind works on what you have heard. Just the hearing is not painful. If someone says to you, you terrible person, yeah, hearing it doesn't make any difference. When the mind interprets those words, that is when the pain arises. So the mind consciousness creates pain out of the hearing. And the same thing if you have pain in the body and then the mind thinks, oh no, this is terrible, then it makes the pain in the body a hundred times worse. That is the difference between mind consciousness and body consciousness. Yes, please. Yeah, he does. It, the dart, the two darts, Sutta, the Vidda, and yeah, you, ha you have the dart or the physical thing. All everyone has to experience, but uh, yeah, so that's exactly right. Uh, yeah. But I think the most suffering is in the mind. Of course, absolutely. So that's the big, big one. That's yeah. The, yeah. So if we can, you know, yeah. Reduce that one. It's already going well. The yeah. One in the mind, that's the most yeah, absolutely. Yes, of course. Yeah, upadana, tan, tanha, clinging. Mm. Mm. Anyone else want to say anything? Everyone else happy? <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. So is it correct to say that uh, arahants can experience physical pain without suffering? Well, uh, Again, remember suffering here is of two kinds. One is the pure physical pain. That is suffering already. But they don't make anything out of that in their mind. Yeah? They don't think, oh no, dukkha, oh, I want to go lie down. They don't think like that. They just, okay, this is dukkha. They don't make anything out of it. So they experience the pain of the body because that is called body consciousness. You don't have any choice. It's there. Bodies are painful. But you don't bring that, you don't make anything mental out of it afterwards. Uh, most people, if you have pain in the body, you create all kind of problems out of it mentally. That is the problem. Uh, that is 95, 99% of the, of the dukkha is that mental thing which happens afterwards. Uh, comes from attachment, comes from craving and all these kind of things. Uh, so it, it, we, when, you th when we say the mind doesn't suffer, actually, well, it's not e exactly right to say that because uh, all consciousness is mental in one way, yeah? So what you need to distinguish between the different kinds of consciousness, uh, the five sense consciousness and the mind consciousness. The mind consciousness doesn't suffer. The mind consciousness is uh, above all of that, has let go. But the five sense consciousnesses, uh, well, actually, you don't really suffer so much through the hearing and the eyes, but certainly body consciousness uh, will still be painful. Uh, yeah? So that, that is a distinction. That's the two darts uh, in the suttas. Uh, that's the, what, what you have to understand. Uh, if you just say the mind doesn't suffer, it's a bit imprecise. It's hard to really understand then what is going on. Uh, yeah. So you saying the mind should be suffering? Uh, I'm saying, yeah. Do you see the difference? Yeah. The two darts, yeah. Body, but physical suffering versus uh, mental suffering. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We have another few minutes. Maybe we can do. Should we do one more sutta or? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let's do one more sutta. This is uh, sutta is called Mother. At Samadhi, mendicants, transmigration has no known beginning. No first point is found of sentient beings roaming and transmigrating hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. It is not easy to find a sentient being who in all this long time has not previously been your mother. Why is that? Because transmigration has no known beginning, etc. This is it quite enough for you to become disillusioned or um, uh, repelled, for you to become dispassionate, uh, and freed from all phenomena, all conditioned phenomena. So uh, uh, this is one of those other things, this is something that you often hear quoted in Buddhism. Yeah, Tibetan Buddhism is quite big on this, uh, the idea that all beings have been your mother at one point. Uh, and of course not just your mother, 
but your father, your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, your auntie, your grandparents, your friends, your whatever, they have all kinds of relationships to you. All beings have been your prime minister at one stage. <laughs> so, yeah, so because samsara is so, is so long. Yeah. Yes? So all beings means uh, includes the cockroaches? Probably, yes. Yeah, yeah. Cockroaches, I don't know about coronavirus though, no? coronavirus maybe not, but uh, cockroaches probably, yeah. <laughs> so uh, sentient beings here, the Pali word is sattu, and sattu basically means any kind of being, yeah. The devas, the devas too, that's, that's more uplifting to think your devas have been your mother, that's kind of more nice. So all, all kind of beings in this sense. So um, what is interesting about this, and what is the many kind of nice things that come out of this, and it's a nice contemplation. Uh, and uh, one of the things that comes out of this is that, uh, remember what the Metta Sutta, the Metta Sutta has to say about kindness and loving kindness, uh, that you should love all beings as if they are, were your only child, as a mother loves their only child. Yeah? And, uh, it's very beautiful because the point about a mother's love for her child is this ability to love regardless of what happens. Yeah, if you join a criminal gang, if you become a drug addict, if you do all kind of bad things in the world, your mother is the last person to give up on you. Yeah, even if you've been to prison for a long time, your mother still, oh, come back, yeah, it's, it's okay, we, we forgive, we let go. Not always, perhaps, but often, yeah, the mother will forgive almost anything. And why is that? Why, why does a mother, or maybe a father as well, or parent, or anyone who is close to you, uh, why do they have that ability to forgive? And the reason, of course, is because they know you. They know you very deeply. Uh, a mother has seen you from you were a tiny little baby, uh, growing up, yeah, and becoming this person, and maybe not so going through your you know, teenage years and maybe the tantrum years when you were really small and all of this kind of thing. They've seen all sides of you when you were very cute and young and when you had, you know, did nice little things. Yeah, like Ajahn Brahm likes to say, even Adolf Hitler wrote a nice letter to his mum. Yeah, so even people who seem really evil, actually they had also had good sides. It's kind of astonishing. Yeah. So the ability of a mother to always remember the good qualities, uh, that is what makes a mother special. Uh. So the moment you look at this, and the moment you remember that you, you have been a mother or a father to all, any being in this world, even that cockroach, remember that cockroach you're talking about, uh, yeah? You have been a mother to that cockroach maybe at some point, yeah? And so remember that, uh, even that cockroach, if it really is your child, uh, how will you think about it in a different way? Uh? You will care even for this living being because you will see a different side to it. And this is such a beautiful way. This is really how you can have more compassion and metta for any living beings. Yeah, because you remind you that they all have a mother. You have been the mother at some stage. At some stage, you would have been able to see the positive qualities even in this person. Yeah, regardless of how bad they were, regardless of the bad things they did. Uh, and this is a great reminder that it is possible to have metta almost towards anyone. Uh, and if you can't have metta, well at least you can have compassion. Uh, but it is possible. Uh, you just have to put yourself in the right spot. Uh, put yourself in the mother mind. Uh, when you have the mother mind, uh, then, or maybe the father mind, then you're able to have that metta for all beings. Uh, so. This is one of the things, it's quite an, it's interesting because this kind of sutta is something you often hear quoted in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, but here it is also in early Buddhism. It's part of how the Buddha taught, yeah, two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, it's part of the early teachings of Buddhism. So uh, it's a useful way of thinking about the world. Sometimes we struggle to have metta. It can be hard, it can be difficult to kind of to find those good qualities in the person. Uh, and this is one of those helpful ways of actually uh, bringing that out uh, and remember, looking very carefully, to find those positive qualities in the people around us. Uh. Does that make sense? Do you feel like you have been the mother and father of all any living being in this world? Does it feel like, <laughs> feel like that? Sounds exhausting, doesn't it? Uh, and you have <laughs> So, so many, 
so many lives. This is the, the nature of samsaric existence. Yes, please. At what level do we stop considering it as a, a, a being? Because when you talk about lower than mammals with the insects, lower than insects will be the worms, lower mm. than worms, mm. we are going down to bacteria. Yeah. But every one of us is killing bacteria every day with our insecticide or, or disinfectant mm. or soap or even we're killing bacteria. Mm. So at what level do we stop saying, okay, this is not a life? Yeah. <laughs> Wayne, you want to say? Pana, pana, breathing. Yeah, that, that is one that is a kind of a traditional way of thinking about it. Pana means breathing. But what does it mean to breathe? It's also a difficult one. Yeah, because almost any, even bacteria, they use oxygen. Oxygen, yeah, to. So that's kind of a breathing. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, one of the one of the um, one of the uh, distinctions made in the Vinaya uh, monastic Vinaya is would, whether you can see the animal or not. Yeah, well, yeah, but that is, I think, outside of the outside of the range of the eyes. They live kind of the other side of the hill. I don't think it means beings that are too small to be seen. And I think the difference is that if you can see the being, then it's much easier to have an intention to kill, yeah? Because you can see it, okay, I will kill that being I can see. Yeah? But when you wash your hands or you use a disinfectant, you don't really have any specific intention. You don't even know if there are beings there. It's a kind of a more of a general cleanliness thing, yeah? And I think because of that, the intention, I, I, I don't know, if I clean my hands with disinfectant, I never have the intention to kill. I don't even think about it. Yeah? It's just that you want to be clean. You wanna, so it's a different way of thinking. Yeah? But if you can see the animal, then you can actually have a very clear intention to kill. I think that is the main difference. Perhaps the best teaching from Buddha we can draw from is the first verse uh, of Dhammapada where he talks about Chakupala. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Of course. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Because no intention. Uh, yeah. No. You don't actually want to do it. Yeah. So intention is so important, and I think, uh, and this is also the thing with e eating meat. Yeah. Is it bad to eat meat or not? Uh, uh, because you can say that you are encouraging killing by by not being vegetarian. But uh, there is a big difference between actually you deliberately killing an animal. Uh, and indirectly kind of you know encouraging the meat industry by my buying meat it's a big difference there and i think that is kind of one of the important points because one case you have a specific intention to kill in the other one there's no intention to kill really you just happen to be part of a large chain an industry and there's two quite different things i'm not saying that being vegetarian is bad i think it's a very good idea i still would encourage people if they ask me but it's not the same and we for that reason we shouldn't really be too judgmental of people just because they eat meat and all of that. Uh, yeah. Adolf Hitler was a vegetarian. <laughs> Who? Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler, yeah, yeah. Devadatta. Devadatta was yeah, <laughs> was a vegetarian. Hitler, Hitler. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you think yeah. yeah. So you so maybe it's bad to be vegetarian. Is it? <laughs> that was a bad idea. No. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is killing, yeah. And in those cases, actually, it is intentionally killing, yeah. But uh, remember that, and I will come back talk more about kamma later on because kamma is a very complex thing, yeah? and so you have to remember the intention there, the quality of the intention matters enormously in that particular case. So when you have worms, well the reason why you kill that worm is because otherwise it's going to be very difficult for you to live with those worms in the long run. It's not going to be very conducive to anything. It may lead to digestion problems, may lead to all kind of discomfort as a consequence. So, so in these kind of cases, there's always exemptions to any kind of rule, and you have to be practical about things. So I, as a monk, if I had some serious intestinal worms, I would also take, uh, take some tablets to get rid of them. Yeah? I would do the same thing, because I think anything else is just going too far in the idea of, uh, 
of ahimsa. Yeah, you have, there comes a point when you have to be practical. You want to survive. You want to have, you know, to make these things work. Yeah. So the point is that if you do it only in exceptional cases like that, you're not really making very bad karma. Okay, there's a little bit of bad, there's a little bit of grey karma in that particular case. It's not good karma for sure, but it's not the same thing as willfully going around killing beings, yeah, because you enjoy killing or anything like that. Uh, you're doing it with regret, you don't really want to do it, but sometimes there isn't much choice. Uh. So uh, this idea of karma is very complex. It all comes has to do with your motivation, what drives you, how much bad qualities are coming with that, whether it's coming from hatred or delusion or greed or whether there's a degree of compassion there and all of these kind of things. Uh, that is what really decides that. Uh, killing is not one thing. Uh, it varies enormously depending on the context. Uh. <laughs> okay, let's have another break uh, and we'll see you back again at 10.30. Uh. <laughs>